All right. So um, I'm very fortunate to be able to introduce our four panelists that are going to be talking today about uh, substance use here in Colorado. So first I want to introduce Rob Valick, who actually is going to shorten his talk so that you guys can get to lunch earlier. So I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> he knows what's important to you all. Um, so Rob is the director of the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse and Prevention. He's also a professor at CU and is also a native Coloradoan as well. And then next we have Leslie Brooks, who's our chief medical officer from Sunrise Community Health. She's also the assistant medical director for North Colorado Health Alliance. And next to her we have Ken Davis, who is the executive director for Northwest Colorado Community Health Partnership. And last but not least, we have Charlotte Ladoni. I did it right, yes. It rhymes with baloney for anyone who needs to remember her last name. <laughs> That's how Charlotte introduced herself, so I think it's only fair. Um, she's the nurse coordinator for the San Luis Valley Area Health Education Center. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. We have an action-packed agenda for y'all today. Um, we have a lot of panel uh, questions, and so I'm gonna go ahead and first open it up with a question for Rob. So why is the opioid epidemic growing and why can we not get it under control? Thanks, Camilla, and thanks everybody for being here. It's great to, uh, to see everybody, so many faces, I've, uh, people I've met, and so many new ones, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, you know, the, everybody hears about the opioid crisis and it's really, it's front of mind. It's certainly not the biggest substance use issue we face. Alcohol is much bigger. Um, you know, tobacco and, and the increase now again in meth and, and all kinds of things. But there is a lot of attention to the opioid issue, so it's not unimportant at all. Uh, and, you know, it's still, despite the fact, you know, there's sort of three points I wanted to make in my talk, so I'll just do it in three or four minutes instead of 30, which is, a, you know, my gift to you, because I'm not standing in between you and a sandwich. I'm not, not going to do that. I've learned that. I don't want to be in between people and, and their lunch. But the sort of points to make is, one is, this is getting worse. You now, overdose deaths are climbing, and both in Colorado and nationally. Uh, you know, it's going up at 8 to 10 percent per year. Still, the rate of growth is what it is, has been the last 8 or 10 years. We're not yet really bending the curve at all on, op on opioid overdose death. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very troubling, obviously. We do more and more each year with trying to address it. Uh, we're putting more and more money into it, still not enough. More and more program development, not enough. And it's really, that's the first place, it's, it's getting worse. We're decreasing our prescribing of opioids as a, as a country by about 20 to 25 percent in the last three years, which is wonderful. We've gone from 260 million prescriptions going out a year to just under 200 million. Uh, but it's still, to me, disconcerting because, you know, we stink less, we overuse opioids a little less but still vastly overuse them is not really comforting to me because there's still way too many opioids being prescribed. Uh, it's like a train going 259 million miles an hour. Now it's only going 200 million miles an hour. It's still a very big, fast-moving train uh, with still exposing a lot of people to opioids every year. And we know that we still give out too many of them, we still give out too many tablets, and we know that 70% of people that have problems start with the leftovers from all those opioids that were prescribed. 17% start with their own leftovers for a different purpose. I saved it for my tooth extraction, now I'm using it because I have back pain or a headache or I just don't feel good. And 6% of people are still using opioids a year later after a major or minor surgical procedure and they weren't taking opioids at all in the first place. So we're getting 6% of the population addicted post-surgically that didn't need to be. And that's about 90% of this problem is that, is sheer, just the sheer exposure problems. We have to get a handle on it and we're not doing a very good job of it. Uh, and we see the consequences from overdose deaths and all these things and we, we try to make change and, and people ask, when is that gonna turn? When's the overdose numbers gonna start coming down? When are we gonna, gonna see this progress we need to see? And it's tough because we still have the faucet too wide open too many people being exposed, and then it, the period between people first non-medically using something and ending up having a problem, dependence, addiction, overdose, and overdose death, that period is nine to 13 years from first exposure to somebody having an overdose death. So there's a decade that has to go by. Once we shut the faucet off, we need a decade for that before we will see things starting to really go down. 
So it's a really difficult thing that's kind of sobering news when I say that, that we'll, but my message was going to be at the end of my talk that we're doing a lot of good things, increasing access to treatment. If we're closing the treatment gap, it's still in Colorado around 75%. It was about 90%. So it's better, but still, the 75% treatment gap is still abysmally bad. Naloxone, we have 500 some odd pharmacies that have naloxone available by standing order. You can walk in and get that. Medicaid covers it without prior authorization. It's, you know, you can just go to the pharmacy and get it. Nobody does. It's a drug that's almost perfect that can keep people alive and almost no one knows about it or goes and gets it. We're educating providers. This woman to my left is single-handedly on a crusade to educate every provider in the state of Colorado about what's going on and how to better prescribe and, <laughs> and how, to, how to do MAT. Yeah. Seriously, how to do MAT in primary care and work with behavioral health, and she is the very definition of somebody who gets it, and, and you know, she has to be on this panel. And she, unfortunately, we need like 2,000 of her. We really do, because we're educating hundreds and hundreds of doctors in person, thousands of them online, and we've probably reached about 20% of the prescribing population. So again, <laughs> a lot of work to do. And so that was my message that, you know, my whole slides uh, that were there is just unfinished business. We have a lot of work to do, and that's why I'm glad to be here, is to make more connections, work with you, uh, and figure out ways to do this and really increase what we're doing, because it is. It's, it's getting worse, and we need to double down on all of the stuff that we're doing to really have an impact. So one of our action steps then is to clone Leslie. So notes, whoever's taking notes. But um, so speaking geographically and from a community perspective, we're gonna ask each of our panelists to paint a picture of what does the opioid crisis really look like in the areas that they're working in and living in as well. So um, Rob, if you wanna go ahead and start. Sure, I'll, I'll speak about the, you know, the big city, you know, Denver Metro. Born and raised in Denver and Park Hill. Went to Manual High School as far as close to downtown as you can get. Go Bolts. So I, I proudly represent the inner city of, of Denver. And, uh, and health equity was an issue. My mom was a champion in the, the 60s and 70s uh, politically to try to, to bring health equity uh, to Colorado and, and in that area and integration and everything that was, was going on. So I'm a proud uh, Coloradan working hard with people like Leslie Harrod in the state legislature to try to bring new initiatives to bring more treatment. Because even in Denver, where people say, hey, you have more access to care there than anywhere in Colorado, which is true. There is more access there than anywhere. It's still very difficult, uh, even in the, in the big city where all the treatment is. There is not nearly enough. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. People have the same issues. I, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Coverage is difficult. Uh, access to treatment is difficult. Transportation, even in the best case scenario where you're in the city, and there's shorter distances, is still a major barrier for people to be able to get care and, and, get, and get into treatment and be able to live their lives. So even in the big city, it's, it's tough, but I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about what it's like around Colorado. Hi, good morning, thanks so much for having us. Um, the issues that we are having in Weldon Larimer County, which is where I practice, are no different than, than any place else. Uh, we have a semi-urban, uh, a lot of rural areas uh, in, in the community where I practice. I practice at a federally qualified health center, uh, and, and, and we are having all the same issues. You know, we, we have pregnant women who can't get treatment. Uh, who are too ashamed to get treatment. And I want to make the case that there is no greater hot potato in medicine than a pregnant substance-using woman. Um, no one wants to touch her. Everyone's terrified of her. Um, uh, so we have uh, pregnant women who, who, who don't have access to treatment, um, who, who struggle to be in treatment and, and do their roles, and, and parent, and child care, and elder care. Uh, because of so many of those roles fall, fall to uh, the women in our communities. Um, we have folks going to the ED who, uh, who overdose um, and, and, and really well-meaning ED docs. And, and I'm, uh, we, we are in conversation with our EDs in, in Weldon Larimer County and we are moving the needle, um, but we haven't moved the needle far enough. Um, we have folks who are being discharged from the ED after an overdose um, with, with messages like, I'm not sure where you can get treatment. Good luck. Good luck, I wish you the best, um, and we'll see you next week. 
Um, you know, and, and so we have all, all of those issues. We have that, the attendant housing issues that go along with those things. We have the attendant access to mental health and behavioral health issues that, that go along with those things. Um, so I'll stop there. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, again, Ken Davis, I'm representing the Northwestern Colorado section, so five counties in the Northwest. And um, in our area, you know, we, we suffer similar problems with access to care. We suffer similar problems with um, the thing, it can't happen to me or it's not gonna happen to me. Um, you know, where people are having to drive three to four hours. Prior to 2018, that's how it was. If you wanted treatment for medicine-assisted therapy in Northwestern Colorado, you had to drive three, three and a half hours over a mountain pass to get to somebody who um, would be willing and able to provide MAT. Um, you know, we had several uh, of our primary care practices. Um, again, they, they would maybe screen for somebody with addiction, and they might even identify someone with addiction. But again, the, the message was, sorry that you have an addiction. We don't know where to send you. So, I, you know, breaking down some of those barriers and raising awareness there. Interestingly, when I started this work, um, this, is, this is the provider's perspective. Like, hey, patients? If you could get the patients to stop asking us for medicines, like that would help us a lot. When you talk to the community, the community was like, you need to talk to the providers to stop providing us with so many darn prescriptions. So we've, uh, we've worked really hard in the Northwestern Colorado region to kind of help br bring those two parties together. And, and, and we've got clinicians on board now. We're, we're making stronger community and clinical linkages such that, um, and in hope, in our county, northwestern Colorado region, we reduced the opioid overdose death rates by 74 percent from 2016 to 2017. So we have made, at least in our region, an impact. So hello, um, I'm Charlotte Ladoni. I'm with the San Luis Valley, and we've worked for the last five years on a number of different issues. And when I say we, it's not just the area help education center that I work for. I also work at Behavioral Health. And we've worked in our agency and with the community in the last five years. And I think that's an important message for all of you to take away. Um, that it's not just one agency that does the work. It's community partners working together, taking a look at what the issues are. You know, of course, we've got transportation issues. We've got, over the last five years, we now have five providers in the San Luis Valley that provide MAT. We have a methadone program. So things are working up. But a nurse once told me that it, she became addicted within five days um, on opioids. And when we talk about behavior change from the behavioral health point of view, it takes years for behavior to become um, ingrained and then changed. So what can happen in a week, we work years at helping clients deal with. And I think that's important for us to remember when we become frustrated that people aren't changing as quickly as we want them to just because we tell them to do, that, to do so. Um, and I will say, as an AD doc, I'm a reformer. <laughs> so it is my problem now, and I need to figure out how to get you somewhere. Um, it's different. It's a completely different conversation than it was even five years ago. And we didn't, we don't get any training in medical school or residency on how to deal with patients like this, other than call psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And then usually call psychiatry says, "Oh, we're we're good. Yeah, <laughs> send it. Yeah, exactly. Send them to us on Monday afternoon." So, um, so, and again, we're partners in this together. So. Um, so one of the things that I know we had spent a lot of time talking about today is also the idea of mental health stigma and what is it and how do we overcome it? I mean, I think a lot of us actually probably inherently know and feel that mental health stigma um, every day when we go out and do what we do, but how in your practices have you been able to overcome the idea of stigma? I can go ahead and start, at least from a community health perspective where we're in the community doing mental health first aid. You know, this is again a team sport. Um, we have Sarah Valentino, who's our behavioral health educator for the region, and she's been a champion of helping to coordinate mental health first aid trainings across all the five counties for the individuals. So, you know, talking to Dana, how she says, you know, bringing darkness to light. Like, we are really actively on the road talking to people, trying to raise people's awareness, and working with um, 
papers and stuff to help people tell their story, to be more public about, oh my gosh, here's a successful business person who has struggled with X, Y, Z, or here's somebody in the community. So really it's, it's bringing that level of awareness so that when somebody might interact with somebody with an addiction or a severe mental health issue, that they have those skills, that they have some knowledge that they might be able to help direct, and then also just raising that level of awareness. And then, you know, working with the clinicians to help break down some of their uh, biases, as we know, clinicians are struggling too. Over 40% of clinicians are struggling with depression in primary care, and we're trying to help people with addiction. So, trying to deal with physician burnout, trying to help them uh, engage with a population that is, you know, when they're going through withdrawal, that's a hard thing to manage. So, helping them to kind of work through those um, struggles. So, I think when I think about stigma working both in behavioral health and teaching nursing students, for me, it is a one-on-one -on -one situation. We cannot just say we're gonna reduce stigma in the San Luis Valley through different agencies. For me, it really is that one-to-one -one interaction with each person that we come across um, because stigma is out there and just because we say behavioral health is a great place to go they'll help you go see your provider they provide MAT there's still that big gap between knowing what clients can do knowing what's available and actually helping them to do that I mean, this is such a complex issue, and, it, and, it, and, and I think we need to address it on so many levels, and it exists on so many, so many levels. It exists in one-on-one -on -one interactions. It exists inside the systems that we have built. Um, and, and for my behavioral health folks out there, a CCAR and a DACOD, can we talk about that? Can we, yes, yes, I echo that, right? You know, so, so, so in primary care, and we, again, I don't wanna throw you guys under the bus because you lay it on the floor every day in service to this population. Um, but, but inside primary care, one of, one of our strengths, we got many weaknesses, but one of our strengths is that once a patient of mine, always a patient of mine. You come and see me today, don't come back for three years, the front desk is gonna ask you for a little bit of information, but they're gonna get you an appointment. Inside our mental health systems, that's not always the case. If you don't continue to engage, you will be closed. And in order to be open again, we must fill out a CCAR. And if you have a substance use issue, we've got to fill out a DACA. Did I get that right, folks? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and, 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 so, and those things, if you are in withdrawal, holy heck. That, I mean, that's hard, that's hard to do, right? It's a 45-minute engagement at the very least if you're being really efficient and, 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 and quick about your, 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 your questions and your questionnaire. Um, so in, in part, it's, it, it exists in the systems that we have built and how we allow um, and pay for people um, to engage with those systems. But we, I put forth to you that we can build systems that are different. Shout out to my partners at Summit Stone uh, Health Partners and at North Range Behavioral Health. Between Sunrise and those two entities, we have built our medication-assisted treatment programs together. We enter the room, primary care and substance use uh, uh, treatment together, um, and we make a plan together. We do case reviews together. We manage patients together, um, um, and we must create, we must bring this issue out of the shadows. To my, to my primary care providers, I, I, I say to you, we must take our heads out of the sand and recognize the issue that is happening before us. Um, in, in one of our many talks that we gave, um, I, I, we had a, we we had a provider um, say to us, you know what, I think, I think we should have an app to help teach our patients how to take their medications appropriately. Um, and, 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 and they described this situation where the patient was chewing their, their, their medication. Um, and so we talked about the fact that perhaps an app is not the tool that is most needed. Perhaps the, perhaps the tool that is most needed is for us to learn how to have a conversation with our patients about how their relationship to their drug has changed and how we must, we wanna treat their primary care issues, we wanna treat their pain and maybe even their terminal illness, but the way we do that must change. So that's just part of my soapbox. Yeah, she awesome or what, this is why it is. Love these people. Uh, anyway, I just want to amplify on, on those that it, I think it really is. What we're trying to do at the consortium, this consortium is this thing that really isn't a thing, except it's all of us trying to stick together and link arms and keep moving. 
is what it really is. And so each of these, and we're trying to enlist, and that's what I'm hoping, is all of you will agree to be deputized or to be a disciple, which if you want to use the law enforcement model in the Old West, you know, everybody's a deputy, or you can be a disciple and, and spread the gospel of, of, of treatment being, uh, being possible and successful and recovery being possible. But it really is. Our successes are doctors talking to doctors and nurses talking to nurses and pa people talking to each other. We have you know, police chiefs like from Evans, Colorado, and nothing's more convincing to a sheriff in La Junta or Lamar than someone who's also a police chief or a sheriff in a small town like Evans coming to say, hey, here's why harm reduction is a good idea. And protection and preservation of human life is our job. So we need to carry naloxone and reverse people and get them into treatment. And it's not our job to judge. It's our job to protect human life. And no better you know, carrier of that gospel than Chief Brandt from, from Evans, Colorado. And so we're trying to do that. And each one of you has that power. And that's what we're hoping is each one of you has that power to carry that to somebody else and say, look, you know, we, need, we need to do this is unacceptable. There's too many people dying. We have effective antidotes. We do have effective treatments. It's hard to get into treatment sometimes. But we have effective treatments that work. Recovery is possible. We have prevention strategies that work. Prevention is possible. We have to do better, and we have to, you know, carry that. So that's what I'm, my, you know, big message is, and that's why the power of the one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can have that, and you can go tomorrow and change one person's mind. And you know, that's why I was trying to do to go to a, a talk to a group of doctors. If I can get one of them to say, okay, I'm not going to refer out. I'm going to start providing medication-assisted treatment for addiction in my primary care practice. Every time I talk in a room of 50 doctors, I just want to flip one and say, okay. I, I'm with you, I'll get the training, and I can refer you to some good people at, at It Matters and get this training, and, and we have this available for you, so we all can work together to do this. So that's, that's the power of it. Can I say one last yeah, thing about course. systems? Um, again, in terms of building systems um, that will allow us to routinize and standardize these things, I, I heard a national speaker recently um, talk, and, I, and he described something that I thought was really illustrative, and, and Camilla, you can probably speak to this as well. But if you have a heart attack in Dinosaur, Colorado, right, um, and there's no cath lab up there, right? If you have a heart attack and, so, and, a, and one of the ED docs, talented ED docs diagnoses you, we can get you treatment. The industry standard is to get you to a cath lab with a needle in your groin and a stent in your carotid arteries within 90 minutes, and we can do that. And what do we do in rural areas? We send a helicopter to come and get you, right? And we have protocols for all of these things. It is routinized to, to, the, to, the, to the furthest corners of our country. We don't have anything like that for substance use. And so I would ask you um, uh, that at the end of this conference that, that, that we would all link arms and, and keep our eyes on the prize of building a system that not only will address opioid use disorder, but for the substance abuse disorder that is waiting behind it once we get this issue solved. Because this is gonna plateau. At some point, this is gonna plateau. And the benzo use disorder and the meth use disorder is waiting for us, I promise you. Um, and if we build a system that will address not just an opioid use disorder, but substance use in general, and having behavioral health, mental health, and primary care working together, we can do this. So I know last year you spent a lot of time talking about inequities, and so I, we wanted to briefly touch uh, on the role that inequity plays in developing substance abuse disorders, treating substance abuse disorders, and then also, of course, in the recovery process as well. So maybe Charlotte, we'll have you start down here. Oops. In terms of developing substance use disorder um, treatment or recovery, what, what role do inequities play? And what are some of the protective factors maybe even as well that could help with that? So again, inequities are so individual. We can see someone that's a white male that has a job and we think they have it made and yet they have a substance use disorder. And we discount that because they haven't made. So we really need to look at each individual, and, and I guess that's where I come from, because I see individuals. Um, I saw a, a woman just recently in our harm reduction program who comes in clearly with behavioral health disorders, um, but just can't get it together 
to make it for an appointment. So we took her to an appointment. And so realizing all the things that come in, and people want to get better, they just, it's just not a priority for them. So figuring out what inequity piece makes it for them and how we can treat that individual with the needs that they have. Camilla, this question kind of calls, reminds me of your comment about trauma, right? I mean, I think I'd like to start there, just from a prevention standpoint. Um, access to mental health services is another area of inequities that, you know, if we could create systems within our communities where we're starting to address social, emotional, traumatic events with our youth, we're gonna be much farther ahead as adults when we start maybe getting accident prone and we might be exposed to opioids a little bit more if you need ac you know, injuries or you have surgeries. So if we can can create this kind of a standard platform, a standard understanding, not only within clinical systems and behavioral systems, but community systems, I think that'd be beneficial. You know, one of the areas where you think about, think about law enforcement, you know, literally 80% of behavioral services are going on in our, in our law enforcement, in our justice systems, but yet we don't provide the necessary services in those realms. I mean, there are literally, you know, I think there's a lot of good people who want to do the right thing, but yet there's policies or there's politics behind all of that, and people will say, well, that's not how we do law. We have to uphold the law. You know, we can't let in somebody who suffers, suffers from addiction, who's stolen, who's, who, you know, really burned a lot of bridges. We can't treat them equally. And, but no, we can. And I think it starts with that. It starts with you know, looking at some of the inequities that we have and then trying to figure out, like, how do we start doing that? And it's through education, through awareness. It's, it's by having some successes and celebrating those successes where we can help, um, you know, see the path. You, you, Get arrested for a heart attack, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it, I like it. And, and, and then we put you in jail and we don't give you your medicine, yeah. right? Right, because it's not covered, right? Um, uh, I, 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 I think those are exactly where, where many of the inequities lie, right? You know, our, our folks with substance use disorder and mental health issues are, are, are incarcerated, right? And, and we're not offering them uh, treatment. I, I went to a national conference recently um, and, and learned about efforts in Kentucky to have a substance use disorder unit in jail um, and and what a what a captive audience, right? Um, and and how people choose voluntarily to go to this unit, um, and how the guards really um, prefer working on this unit, where individuals are engaged in treatment and and where behavior issues are are better managed, and where and 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 where people are working together uh, uh, more closely, um, and le and there's less acting out. Like there are ways in which we can address these these equity issues. Um, I think some of the legislation that that Rob worked so hard um, with the interim study committee to 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 achieve in terms of getting Medicaid to cover uh, uh, rehabilitation stays uh, uh, inside Medicaid. Those are huge areas of inequity. I have many patients um, for whom uh, they come and we recognize their substance use disorder and I do the ASAM criteria that says you ought to go to inpatient treatment and I got nothing for you. I got a big goose egg for you. Um, uh, and, and, and we have folks going to places um, including my clinic, including my clinic, where where we can where we can get you buprenorphine and we can get you Vivitrol, um, but so frequently our folks with substance use disorders bounce around from clinic to clinic, where they have where they get the substance use disorder buffet that is available at that clinic, um, rather than an assessment. And and and, and I'm, again, I'm not throwing any of us under the bus, right? We have work to do. We're doing we're doing a ton of good work, but we have more work to do to begin with the assessment, right? To begin with the assessment and make sure that all of our clinics who are doing medication assisted treatment have the bevy of of medication assisted treatment options that are available so that if my patient needs Vivitrol, I ought to be able to get him Vivitrol if that's the best solution for them. And this is, Rob's gonna roll his eyes, but um, you know, the, the continuum of care that is opioid use disorder, you know, according to the FDA, right, is methadone, buprenorphine, and, and naltrexone, right? But 
if, if you come to my clinic and I, I try and get you buprenorphine and, and, and you know, we do okay, but maybe that's not the, the right treatment for us, then we move on to Vivitrol and yeah, that doesn't go so well. But if I wanna get you methadone, which is the other option, I gotta send you someplace else. I gotta send you someplace else and we have put them on an island, right? Right, 42 CFR um, doesn't allow, doesn't allow um, a lot of information sharing between, and we can build partnerships to fix this, um, but, but it doesn't allow a whole lot of information sharing so that I know that Leslie, who's my patient, um, is also a patient at the local opioid treatment program and is on methadone and I shouldn't give her rifampin, right? Um, or I should be really cautious in giving her other medications, right? I don't have any way of knowing that we have built inequities into this system that we can fix. Um, so one of the things that the Colorado Health Foundation, I think, is also going to have a, a very strong focus on is this idea of continuum of care and talking about resiliency really from early childhood all the way through adulthood as well. So can you talk a little bit about how to build that resiliency, how to build that coping skills? I know I talked about my own personal story as sort of how I coped as a, as a child. Um, and so in your kind of roles that you have as well, what are some of your thoughts on how to build that kind of res resiliency from, really from infancy, toddlerhood on? I think it, in part it begins with treating the pregnant woman. It begins with making sure that she has access to the substance use care that, that she needs, uh, among the many things that, that create vulnerable children, right, is, 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 is um, a, a mother with a substance use issue. Um, so it begins by offering appropriate treatment to, to, to parents um, because we can't, we can't create a resilient home if we don't have a resilient mom and if we don't have a resilient, uh, if we don't have resilient parents. So I think that's one place. Um, I'm gonna go one up on you, Leslie, and Sorry. say it begins with family planning. An unintended pregnancy, you know, it's, it's a human right, and yet here we are struggling in this day and age to have women um, have the right to choose whether or not they get pregnant. So, you know, starting with making sure we can access that is huge. Um, I believe social determinants health. We have, we have a, a mandate. We, we, we are all in this together, but we need to be addressing people's gaps in our social terms of health. We will never help people get into sustained recovery if we don't also be looking at what is their transportation? What is their housing like? What is their interpersonal violence? What is some of their social isolation issues like? And yes, many of those issues have been caused by their addiction, but we cannot ignore them because we need to help them kind of start re repairing some of those broken and damaged bridges. So let me flip that around a little bit and have us think about resiliency, not as it starts in utero. It starts, you know, um, with the birth, helping the mom. Let me have us think about it starts anywhere so that we're not saying, well, this child's already been in a home for five years that's been very abusive, or we now have a teenager that's abusing drugs and hasn't learned resiliency. How can we teach that wherever people are at as they come to us and not say, well, they didn't have it, so I guess they'll never have it? One of the things that we've tried to do in Northwestern Colorado is really, we, we're gonna do some planning around child maltreatment prevention so that where it's gonna be some work coming out of that. We've engaged in a program we call Music of Vision. Well, Music and Vision is, yes, at, at, at the outset, like, oh, that's just a fluffy type of thing, but it's an opportunity to use music as a way to leverage in our minds and our bodies and our spirits a deeper social and emotional connection. So once we can start working through that, we can help kids, to, you know, we're taught, oh, you gotta keep those emotions down. We can't let, you know, pull up your bootstraps like we're rugged individuals. So it's like, no, we need each other to, to thrive in our society. And so we're trying to break down some of those barriers as we move along in this continuum of care. So I think this is an exciting time to be. I think there's a lot of great uh, energy, a lot of great innovation that's um, looking, I think, social media apps and stuff like that, we haven't even begun to touch the impacts that some of those technologies, they can also lead to problems. I know if you've heard about FOMO, that's an issue, right? Fear of missing out. Over half percent of our teens, if they're not with their phones, they start having anxiety, palpitations, and they start having legitimate um, sensations of, of addiction. Um, I will add to any any thoughts too about specifically about I know there's folks in our audience who um, deal with that kind of teenage and early 
kind of young adults as well too, because we know um, that's a whole separate issue. I know that teen suicide is something that is very concerning for a lot of folks as well too. Again, very much linked to substance use and bullying and online, social media, et cetera, as well. But any thoughts on sort of building resiliency in that population as well? I, I know we have to talk to our youth. I know that we are making decisions for them and decisions about them without them. Um, and we think we know what they're saying when we're not around, but we haven't asked them, we haven't talked to them. I know we have a, we have a session coming up later uh, where I think Karen is gonna speak to um, some, some leaders among our youth, but, but we, are, we are talking about them and we are making policy decisions and we are making treatment decisions and, and systems decisions without inviting them to the table. Um, and, 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 and that's a mistake. That, that, that's a mistake. Um, I, I, I also w wanna just say also, and, and, and let these guys address that question as well, um, that, that one, of the, one of the places in which we also have to lead in terms of resiliency is having a conversation, that not just as, as primary care providers um, and, and providers in general about, you know, how much pain can I get you out of? How much pain can I truly get you out of? It's not, it's not reasonable to me for me to let you have an expectation of zero pain, right? Um, so we, we have to do that in the exam room, but we also have to do that in our communities and have a conversation about what is, it, what is a reasonable expectation of pain, right? If I put you on opioids and that, your pain goes from a 10 to a seven, the opioids have done its job, right? They're good for about a three point reduction in, in your pain. You wanna get from a seven to a four, we're gonna need something else. And, and, and are we having a conversation in our communities about what is an expectation of pain? What, what, what's it gonna take to get you to a, to, rather than having a, a, a pain target, what's the function target? What can't you do now that you want to be able to do? And how are we sh frame shifting um, that conversation? And, and what are the tools and coping mechanisms that it's gonna take um, to get us there? So I, I think as I, as I work, I do a lot of addiction work and primary care work and, 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 and chronic pain work. And, and one of the things that I think I see in a lot of um, my adult patients with, with chronic pain um, is is um, hopelessness, not 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 suicidal hopelessness um, always, although sometimes that happens, but a hopelessness of community and and no supports and and no place and no no context in which to identify what are the supports in my life that I can call upon rather than reaching for the bottle of oxycodone because my sister came by and pushed my buttons. And I think what that means for all of us is time. And we don't feel like we have the time to be able to sit down with people and have that conversation. And that is so important. We have to be able to get to some underlying concerns that they have. And that takes time. And we can't bill for time most of the time. So this makes me think, again, Leslie, going off what you said about the importance of community, we have some good evidence behind some community transformation projects. And I would point to Blue Zones transformations. It's a wellness longevity model that has been studied showing over five, out five different countries and communities in these countries that populations disproportionately live past 100. And Tony and Dan Butner are the kind of the forces behind that. It costs a lot of money to do it but they've created these power nine principles that they certainly engage individuals to take on as an individual level. But if you want to pay the millions of dollars to help them come into your community and you can prove to them that you have the money, that you have the community champions to it, they will come and help you transform your communities using these nine, guided by these nine power nine principles to really create that that environment that may not be you as a counselor that has or a nurse that has the time, but it might be your neighbor. It might be, you know, somebody that you are part of this group that comes together on a weekly basis for either an exercise program or for a nutrition meal or for just walk. I mean, you, you educate the community up to a certain level. It doesn't have to fall on the shoulders. What it does have to fall on is we see things escalate, like they need to know when to refer to the specialist. But, you know, I, I do believe that if we can learn to empower these individuals. And not, not that clinicians like ourselves aren't important, but we've given up a lot by saying, Leslie, you're the one who's gonna help me with my pain. Like, you're, you're, like 
versus I'm the one who's going to take care of my pain or I'm going to take care of my suffering and I'm going to do these things and I might need medicines. Yes, I might. But by, by all means, I am going to be the one who's going to do everything in my power first and foremost before I even start you know, thinking that I have to use medicines because we know those medicines have side effects, whether or not it's addiction, whether or not it might make you more depressed or more suicidal. Like we, we need to, you know, that's, I'd like to see that. I actually have a question specifically for Rob. So I know that um, this year the legislature has passed um, five different bills that have all gotten Governor Hickenlooper's um, signatures, both for behavioral health and mental health as well. And so how is policy advocacy a tool that can really be used to help us move this needle? I think it's, it's, it's obviously it's hugely important that we talk to and engage our legislators and work at the, at the state level uh, really at any level of, of, of government and policy making, it could be municipal or state or federal, to do things that are going to help us to, to be healthier and to help people get access to the care they need. Uh, and I will say that our legislature, you know, starting last year with this interim study committee on opioid and other substance use disorders, uh, started meeting last year. Uh, ten legislators, you know, five Democrats, five Republicans, uh, five women, five men, five more urban, five more rural and frontier. I thought they did a really good job, must have spent hours figuring out just how to balance the committee. So you really can't argue very much that it was a biased committee in terms of makeup. But they sat there, and I will give them credit. They sat there for six meetings, eight hours apiece, to just sit and listen to people coming from around the state and our, our consortium and the Attorney General's task force and others gathered everybody from state agencies, health professions associations, people in prevention, uh, screening and intervention, treatment community, the recovery community, uh, all getting together and spent 50 hours telling them about what this is. And the legislators really you know, were soaking this up, uh, needed extra time for the unscheduled unofficial meetings that they weren't even allowed to have, and so they gave more of those. Uh, and then drafted legislation in six areas, looked at this across the continuum, and we tried to stress to them, they must understand what the continuum is and start to view things as to where are holes in the, in the continuum that they, we can start to fill with what the state legislature can do. And the legislature can create policy, can put regulations you know, in place or laws anyway and tell the regulatory agencies to put them in place. They can try to remove barriers if there are certain things they can knock down, certain barriers. They can increase funding for certain things. Beyond that, the state legislature can't do much. But that is an awful lot. So we told them they needed to be doing things. And we created six buckets, if you will, or six focus areas from prevention to the provision of medical care, to harm reduction, to treatment, to workforce development, to payment reform. And said if we bucket them this way, we can make progress in these areas. And five of the six we made significant improvement in. The one of them that was, the, I'll talk about the one that we lost, was a harm reduction bill, basically, that was, uh, had the words safe injection site in the legislation, and that, that killed it. But that's it, you know. The language in that was, uh, the stigma is so great, we knew this would be it, but we advanced the conversation by forcing a bunch of, a room full of legislators to sit there for three hours and hear 200 people testifying about why this is important, and start the conversation about what harm reduction and keeping people alive really means. And, and so we sacrificed, and I say we, I'm not, on, I'm not in the legislature, but the royal we sacrificed one piece of legislation to start a conversation. The other pieces were super important. More money for prevention, school-based screening and school-based treatment and school-based health centers couldn't be more important. You know, to do all of these things are super important, right? More money for provider education for cl somehow cloning Dr. Brooks. So we have to, you know, we have to talk to you know, more providers. Um, they even voted to keep themselves in business for two more years. Got stuck in the first bill. But the interim committee will exist this summer and next summer. So we get three years of opioid summer camp, which is great. So it's like band camp, except we go to the legislature all summer. <laughs> and we really do. We spend 50 hours or more in the summer in the, in the, in the interim session talking about this stuff and the legislators show up and they're there all day and it's really, a, it's, it's good to see. The, we address provider, or provider issues for telling docs, hey, for someone who hasn't had an opioid prescription before, you can only give them seven days worth to start off with. Cut it out with giving them 90 or 180 tablets, just don't do that anymore. You have to be reasonable guardrails and we got the medical society to sign on and say, we, we co-sponsor and support limits on ourselves. 
which for the first time in, in the history of, of this Colorado Medical Society, they have never done it. We've gotten them over to say, look, we have to address this, we have to be on board with certain things and collaborate reasonable guardrails for doctors. They have to check the prescription drug monitoring program if they're gonna go on and continue to prescribe them. And they agreed with that, that if we're gonna do, so they have to self, you know, limit some of the things they're doing to help put the, pump the brakes on the opioid overprescribing, right? They have to help do that. The third bill I mentioned, the one that died, was harm reduction. The fourth one was workforce development, important to, to, to provide incentives for behavioral health folks, not just train more doctors to do MAT and prescribers, but we have a corresponding workforce issue with behavioral health providers that we need more. If we don't have substance abuse counselors, medication can't assist anything. It's called medication-assisted treatment. The treatment is not the medication. The medication helps somebody's brain get down to a slow enough speed so they can do the treatment that they need to get their lives back, and we need that. The biggest success we had was House Bill 1136, which, which directs Medicaid by law in statute now to apply for a federal 1115 waiver under Medicaid and draw down the federal benefit for de detox, inpatient, and residential treatment under Medicaid. And the legislature put $35 million of money, which they, again, we do not have $35 million lying around. The only source is from the marijuana tax cash fund. There's $200 million in that fund this year that were new dollars. We asked for, you know, basically all of it. And they said, no, we got roads, bridges, prisons, K through 12, everybody who's tied up by Tabor that has no access to new money without doing a ballot initiative. Everybody wants the $200 million. And we said, people are dying, people cannot get treatment. The single biggest hole is medical withdrawal management, inpatient and residential treatment under Medicaid, because that's the, the, payer, the largest payer for substance use disorder services is Medicaid. We have to fill that hole. So we're gonna get the 35 million we will put in, we'll draw down $140 million in federal money, so we will have $175 million of new treatment money coming into Colorado next year. So that would, it will make a dent in the 75% treatment gap. We know we can't solve it overnight, but it will make a dent. And then the last piece of legislation seems small, but it was saying you cannot take somebody and have a long term for prior authorization. It was called payment reform bill. But so insurers have to provide same day, 24 hour turnaround on prior authorization requests for medication assisted treatment. If they don't meet same day request, uh, re uh, return with the prior auth request, coverage is presumed. So it's mandated. So that's one piece of that which was important. The second is everybody, regardless of insurer, is now entitled to a basic benefit of at least one five-day course of medication-assisted treatment per year. So everyone, if it's your Medicaid, any insurer has to cover at least one induction. So give somebody at least one try for five days and then maybe get them started. Um, so that's, a, 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 we think, a very you know, large degree of success from these five bills at the legislature this year, and we're pushing again, pushing hard this year to try to get them to do more. We think it's, you know, policy, policy advocacy is very important. The last point I'd make on it is the legislators listen. They listen to providers that come and tell, tell them stories about, here's how I treat patients at sunrise, or here's how I see patients at, in harm reduction in Alamosa and the San Luis Valley. This is what we see. This is what we experience. Nothing motivates a legislator like a constituent provider who tells them a story about how hard it is to provide care and that people are suffering and dying for it. So please get engaged in this process. Tell your stories to your legislators. Show up at the Capitol and sign up to testify. And in three minutes, you can have an impact that you'd be surprised uh, how strong you are. Well, I would just add, from a policy perspective, Senate Bill 74 has been transformative for Route County. Pueblo and Route Counties were a part of a pilot project for expanding medicine-assisted therapy to physician assistants or nurse practitioners. In Route County, what that has translated to is we went from having one mental health provider who is doing suboxone maintenance to now, I believe there's close to 10 providers who are now doing MAT in the Route County area. And the, the, the person who, who was awarded that pilot 
uh, grant. She's working really close with our law enforcement agencies and we're starting to do some medical detoxes for individuals before they're getting into prison so that the deputies and the lieutenants of the prisons aren't having to deal with people in significant withdrawals. And, and we've, um, we've applied for a SAMHSA grant to actually do this over the next three years across multiple counties. And, and uh, if anybody out there has any SAMHSA connections, I'd love for you to put in a push for us. But, um, you know, this is, has really transformed um, Route County as far as our ability to get access to care so that people aren't having to drive to Denver and they're now able to get care in the communities in which they live. So it's, it's huge. So I'm always the boots on the ground kind of person because that's what I do. Um, so yes, we have medication assisted treatment. It's wonderful. But what I hear from clients is, how do I get there? How do I detox enough to get on it? And then what other needs do people have that impact whether medication assisted treatment's gonna work or not? And those are the pieces we also need to look at and that's where all of you come in because you probably are not prescribing, but you're going to be in some way impacting the lives of these patients and let's give them the best that we have. Hello. Oh, um, I, you know, in, in following on that, I, I, I also want to bring up um, and, and say that um, medication, the, 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 there are a great many ways that people come to recovery, right? Um, and they don't exist in, in a vacuum. Um, this is not a one-size-fits-all um, uh, uh, treatment modality, right? This is a team sport, as, as, you, as you said earlier. And abstinence and medication-assisted treatment do not have to be mutually exclusive. Um, a great many people come to their recovery through abstinence-based programs, but we need to be smart about how we deploy that resource. The vast majority of research inside abstinence-only programs comes from doctors, lawyers, and pilots. Um, and I submit to you that the disease in those individuals, as well as our, as, our, as our everyday folks who are not among those populations, is the same. But that brain is different. That brain is different. If you have made it through med school and pilot school and, um, and, and law school, um, that brain is different than the brain that started using at 12 years old. Um, and, and was subjected to uh, myriad childhood traumas, which is not to say that that does not exist in, in, in other populations as well. But we need to be smart about how we deploy the treatments that are available, and we don't have to do it alone. We don't have to fight. Um, we don't, you know, the medication-assisted treatment uh, community does not have to beat the abstinence community up over the head uh, with, with MAT and, and, and vice versa. Um, this is not one size fits all. It is going to take a, 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 a buffet of services um, to get someone to recovery. Um, that may include abstinence for some and that may include medication assisted treatment for others and they don't need to exist in a vacuum. They can exist together. They all must have counseling services. Behavioral health counseling is just a foundational thing they that must. needs to have access to. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are many places that are not um, lucky enough to have uh, embedded behavioral health. I go around the state and I tell people that we have you know, 10 embedded behavioral health folks that don't work for Sunrise, but that work for our community mental health partners. Um, and people start shooting me dagger eyes, right? They're, yeah. they're like, we've had positions open for three years and, and, and we can't fill them. Um, but, but, but however you make this work, I mean, there is a whole continuum of ways to partner with our, our behavioral health folks. Um, um, and it doesn't have to be uh, embedded behavioral health care. Um, it can be co-located care. It can be uh, a partnership with folks across town. It can be building relationships with your 12-step, um, local 12-step programs. Um, it, it can look like a whole host of things, but it must be there. It must be there. That leads us, I think, to our question of um, where do you find hope? when it comes to overcoming this, the opioid epidemic. I know, I know we've, we've talked a lot about the challenges, right? And I think we spend a lot of time probably beating ourselves up that we're not doing as much as we can or we should be doing more, but where do we see hope and opportunity um, coming up? Well, that's, that's, where, that's where it works for me, is that every single client that I see, we try to figure out where that hope is. Um, and it takes a while to get there. It, because a lot of these clients through childhood traumas have lost that hope, have lost the thought that they can make changes for themselves. And so for me, again, it's very individual. 
and I get those little sparks all the time, or I'd have been retired by now. So um, I'll just self-confess that I'm, I'm a glass half full type of guy, just so you know up front. So I've got, I see hope in every corner there can be. And, um, and so just, you know, let's celebrate. You know, Colorado is a sim community. We have worked on getting integrated behavioral health services into primary care, and that is, that is unique to Colorado. And we need to celebrate that. Not only do we have SIM, but we have regional health connectors spread across our state. That's, a system, that's somebody who's embedded in our communities looking at systems level work, um, at, at how we are addressing barriers or gaps and things. And so we have this workforce that is kind of at the ready, already doing some of this stuff in our communities. There's been a lot of celebrations of regional health connectors helping to bring those community collaborations a little bit stronger in addressing this issue at the community level. Now that we can also talk about the accountable health communities model. We have a grant here on a western slope that is really looking at how do we bring together our community partners to start screening more proactively for social determinants of health in primary care because we know we don't have the time to do that ourselves. We have to have a different system in us to help us do this. But so we're getting these, so we have that going on. And then we got the color consortium. My gosh, you think about and as a governor appointed committee that is, their job is to make sure you're going around to the state and making sure that we're sharing best practices and helping to connect communities to the resources they need. And Rob, I can't thank you enough for, you know, when Mara and I started the co-funded the RX Task Force, like you were the first one to call me up and say, Ken, I hear you got something going on in Northwestern Colorado, tell me more. And you're like, let's have monthly meetings. Let's start figuring out like, where's the direction? And when we talked about the party initiative and we said, these are our struggles, you were like, okay, well, I know somebody over here, we'll start talking about some things, resources here, and I know somebody over there, and you know, maybe we can get some assistance from them. And soon, soon after, there's a, there's a bill being introduced to, to expand medicine assisted therapy. So it's, it's that that gives me hope. And the fact that we, we've demonstrated we can do this. Northwestern Colorado, as I will say again, we have been able to reduce the opiate overdose death rates by 74% in one year. And it, and it takes grit, it takes determination, but it is possible. <laughs> I, you know, I, I could not be prouder to practice in Colorado um, where we innovate, full stop. Yeah. We, we innovate, um, and, and we see it everywhere. We see it in, in, in much of what Ken talked about. We see it in the consortium. We see it in the North Colorado Health Alliance, uh, where, where, where I work in Northern Colorado, where we, are, where we have programs focused on social determinants of health. And it is tough to get folks to pay you to do social determinants of health work. Um, we, we, we are developing programs to partner with our law enforcement. We are having conversations with, with our ED uh, uh, partners and our, and our hospital partners um, to create connected levels of care so that there is a place to, 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 dis, to, to discharge someone um, to, to continue what's been recognized on the inpatient, on the emergency department side, to continue what's been recognized inside that, that, that acute law enforcement encounter. Um, um, uh, and finally, I, I get hope. I, I, love, I love doing my chronic pain work. I love being a primary care doc, um, but I especially love the addiction work that I do. Um, it is incredible to watch people stitch together the, the strings and fabric of their lives um, after, after so much devastation. This is an incredibly resilient population. You can call it lying and manipulation if you want to, but this is an incredibly resilient population and they have skills and strengths um, that we can and must make use of um, in terms of helping them to get to the recovery that they, that they are looking for. And I really, I have hope because of people like these three people and really all of you in this room, because you would come here and you would take three days of your time to figure out what else you can do to help promote the health of our communities. I'm a native born and raised Colorado and I've been to all 64 counties in the state twice and I'm in 57 counties into my third time around. Uh, every county in Colorado and that's, uh, I've visited them once since the governor said I want you to visit every, every county. So I've been there once, and I'm almost around again. And it really is the, the, the spirit of Colorado. I'm very proud to be a Coloradan. And it, the spirit of Colorado really is, is strength and innovation and caring. And it really is, is, despite the challenges that we face, we really are already 
ahead of most states in terms of our response. We, you know, I, I go around a lot and, and talk to folks from our region uh, and the Rocky Mountain states and my counterparts there. And now we're, we're getting asked, how on earth do you do that? You know, your public awareness numbers are higher, your dispo safe disposal numbers are higher, how many meds are coming back, your rate of prescribing decrease is faster. You know, some of these things are growing MAT in rural areas faster than we're able to do in other states. Uh, more doctors being trained out in those areas. How, how on earth are you doing this? And I just said, because we all get together and just say, we have to do it. And that's kind of what we do. Let's figure it out. Let's, these are solvable problems. The, there's hope in we know some of the things that work. We need more things that work, but we know prevention things that work, harm reduction things that work, screening methods that work, methods of treatment that work. Uh, we know what some of the recovery-oriented systems of care that work. We just need to, to keep doing it and do more of it. And, and so I think there's hope in that, that if each of us you know, can continue to work together like this, that we can continue to, to move this faster. So I want to thank Dana, um, especially for sharing your story of recovery. And I think what that does is it gives us a really personal viewpoint of so much of the work that we've talked about some today. Um, and it really gives it sort of that take home message, right? That there's so much ongoing work that she and her family continue to do. Um, but there's obviously a lot of ongoing work that we as a community have to do as well. So I want to leave it. We've got just one more minute. Any last words of wisdom for our um, our audience, I will say this is probably the most hopeful panel I've ever been on. <laughs> Usually it's doom and gloom for most of our, our health-related issues, but um, I am feeling hopeful. Um, that is all I can say. So I'm going to leave it with any other um, last parting thoughts that you have as well. So I've been to many conferences over the years, and I come away leaving saying, wow, and I'm on a high. My challenge to you is to continue that high. Go back to your community. And I'm not one to tell you what will work in your community. You know what works in your community. And, and it may seem overwhelming, but you find one other person in your community that shares that passion. Have them find one other person. Get together and talk about what can we do. And I'm not just talking agencies. I'm talking community groups, faith-based groups. So that's my challenge to you when you go back. I, I've ended a couple different presentations with these three words, stop, drop, and roll. Stop, stop the darkness. Bring this to light in your communities with your providers. Drop the notion that this is not a problem, that this can't happen to you because darn well it can happen to you. And let's get ready, roll up your sleeves, and let's do something about it. Don't sit on the sidelines saying somebody else is going to do it because the longer you wait, the more people, the more lives that are lost. Roll up your sleeves. Let's join together in arm, in spirit, to help lead Colorado where no other state has gone before. We have the energy. We have the power. We have the resources. We've got a lot of innovation and energy in us. Let's make it a reality. That's a great note to end on. Um, we have work to do. Let's get to it. I just, two words, one, well, two comments. One, clean out your damn medicine cabinet. Because <laughs> I know you people in this front row. There's 10 of you, and four of you have opioids left over in your medicine cabinet. I know you do. I'm going to follow you home. Don't think I won't do it. I will do it. And if there's fewer than four, I'll give you 100 bucks each. And if there's more, four or more that have opioids in your medicine cabinet, I'll expect the check. And, and I'll win every time. So that's, it's kind of, it's funny, but it's sad. So clean out your medicine cabinet, because that's, remember, 87% of this stuff starts with the leftovers. That's something you can do to go home and impact this problem in 30 seconds when you get home, is do that. And the second thing is, I agree, is go, go you know, convince one person and that this collective impact is going to happen if each of you goes and convinces one more person that, that we can do something more and we can do this, because it's going to happen one conversation at a time, like Charlotte said at the very beginning. It's going to happen one conversation at a time, and go talk to your local law enforcement agent or your doctor, your pharmacist, your friend, your behavioral health person, your, your pastor. Go talk to someone and have the conversation. And thank you for being here. So um, stop, drop, and roll. Not only is it good for what we're going to do from a collective impact, but also if you're on fire. And <laughs> secondly, it would not be creepy if, if, uh, if you followed 
um, them home today. That's what we've learned. But go home and uh, clean out your medicine cabinet. So thank you all very much. We're going to break for lunch.